Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us today here on our bank fishing for walleye, sawgye, and sauger ask an angler webinar. So today we're going to be covering public waters in Oklahoma um, that are going to have either walleye, sawgye, or sauger in uh, those bodies of water and what you're looking for to target them when you go bank fishing. Unlike most of the game species here in Oklahoma, the walleye, sawgye, and sauger, which are members of the true perch family, um, including the yellow perch that exists in most of the northern and western United States, you can find it. Um, here in Oklahoma, we don't have yellow perch. There are log perch that can be found on the Arkansas River. They're caught very randomly and it's not very common. Um, so these perch species, they are toothy fish. So inside of their mouths, instead of having the kind of sandpaper type mouths, they're gonna have needle-like sharp teeth, equivalent to that of like a small kitten or a small dog. So Sticking your hands in their mouths to get lures out is uh, not ideal. You're going to want to use pliers. So let's talk just a little bit about the species themselves before we get into kind of the bodies of water you're looking for, where you're looking to go, what you're looking to use, what type of time of year that you're ultimately looking to fish to have the best success um, as far as bank angling goes. So being that the only true uh, species of these three that is actually native to Oklahoma, the sauger, which is native to the Arkansas River Basin um, and is more of a riverine fish that doesn't grow to too great of sizes. A uh, big fish is going to be somewhere around, you know, four pounds, three or four pounds are going to get up to maybe 18, 20 inches. They can certainly grow bigger, but the average size sauger that you're going to see caught is going to be somewhere in the 10 to 16 inch range most of the time. Um, this is kind of the time of year where we see a lot of the bigger fish caught as those sauger are pushing up um, to go into kind of their spawning cycle. Being more of a temperate species, the walleye especially, and then the sauger being a hybrid of sauger and uh, walleye, a female walleye crossed with the male sauger to attain the larger weights um, of the walleye, as well as give the fish more of a tolerance to our warm and turbid waters um, that the sauger is more adapt to. So we get a good cross and we get sauger. And sauger are really the most prevalent of the three species in the state, mainly because we aggressively stock them. Um, and they're used as a management tool for us on lakes, especially that have uh, overabundant crappie populations. Uh, Sagai, one of their number one forage foods is crappie. Um, they have the equipment with their mouth to do some pretty good damage on undersized crappie. So they're a great manager on lakes that don't get heavily fished for crappie where we see overpopulation. So Sagai are a great resource for the angler. Um, but they're also a great tool for fisheries managers here in the state um, to help on their lakes to improve uh, the overall crappie population and size structure of those fish. So having said that, um, we'll talk a little bit about walleye. So walleye were introduced into the state several decades ago. Um, they are a cold weather fish. So they are a fish that is... Um, very common up in the north central part of the country and extending into central Canada. That's kind of their home range where they are at their best. Um, being a temperate species, they are going to spawn pretty early on uh, because they spawn right after ice out uh, up in the north, which is typically somewhere between April and June, depending on where you're at. And those water temperatures are fairly cold when you come out of ice out. I mean, you're iced out at 32 degrees, you come out of that into the low 40s and those fish are looking to spawn. Um, walleye here in Oklahoma are a little bit more adjusted to our water temperatures. And so typically you're seeing the walleye spawn um, happening as we speak. Uh, those fish here over the course of the next month will be looking to get up onto uh, wind and current swept areas, especially up on dams. Um, they will also travel upstream on inflowing rivers when they have the opportunity to do that. Um, the premier walleye fishing lake in the state is going to be Canton. Um, and at this time of year, anglers can find walleye of 
all different sizes, um, you know, all the way up to 10, 15 pound walleye down to eight inch walleye uh, up against the dam right now. Uh, those fish are going to be going through their spawning cycle. Um, and they're typically a nocturnal feeder when it comes to coming up shallow. So this is, this is really that key time of year to get after uh, walleye, especially where they're in that shallow water during daylight hours and during, you know, pretty much 24 hour periods where they can be found uh, most of the other times a year. It's very hit or miss of getting walleye, especially, but sawgai and sauger as well um, in shallow water where they're accessible to bank anglers. So now is the time of year to really take advantage of these fish species from the bank. Um, walleye are also in several other reservoirs around the state. They're in pretty low abundance. Um, there are fish within the Grand River system and Arkansas River system. So Kerr, uh, Fort Gibson, uh, Hudson, there's going to be walleye kind of mixed throughout that, the Weber's Falls area um, of where fish were stocked and have been flushed downstream, moved upstream into tailwaters, and they're kind of sporadically spread out in there. But it's that's just a very kind of random chance by anglers that you just happen to be there at the right time where you find walleye in those areas where you can accept, access them from the bank. Otherwise, sawgai are going to be kind of more of the key species um, in the state to go after. Uh, they're great tasting. Uh, walleye are highly sought after um, and arguably the number one uh, freshwater fish as far as table fare is concerned. You get really good thick fillets off of them. Um, they're a nice flaky white fish. You can cook them in a lot of different ways, but you you really get this long, consistent kind of chunk of a fillet, and that's why they're so heavily sought after. Well, sawgai are exactly the same, and they're more adapted to um, our water climate. So they uh, are found in more abundance in more areas of the state than you'll find walleye or sauger. So a lot of this will be kind of focused on sawgai fishing, um, but the same techniques are going to find you walleye on the lakes where we have them. And then we'll also talk a little bit about sauger fishing in um, our river systems. But again, that's a pretty low abundant fish, um, not heavily sought after. Uh, looking over at the chat bar, what depth is considered shallow Shallow for walleye? Um, in lakes in Oklahoma, we don't have expansive like grass flats and summering habitat that you'll find with walleye up north, um, where shallow for walleye up there might be, you know, four feet where they, they can really push into some heavy vegetation near channel ledges and drop offs. Um, and they're going to utilize a lot of that in the summer because walleye up north are a prey species for pike and for muskie. Um, so up there, they're going to act more like a prey species, like a sunfish or a crappie that's really going to look to utilize shallow cover. Here in Oklahoma, they're not much of a prey source. Um, they grow to big enough sizes that they're on par with your largemouth bass and catfish um, that could potentially predate on them. So their predation is going to be on their young um, eggs, fry, juveniles in that first year after that, um, just kind of where they live uh, most of the time in our waters, they're fairly safe from predation. Um, so shallow in Oklahoma is going to be pretty much water that's less than 20 feet. Um, this time of year, it's going to be very shallow. You're going to see, especially walleye as they attempt to spawn. Sagai will attempt to spawn with minimal success. They are hybrids, so there are going to be a lot of sterilization within those fish species, but there is the potential for um, reproduction. It's just very low within the sawgai species. Um, so with sawgai pushing or with walleye pushing up at this time of year, you know, you're looking at water that's less than 10 feet and that's going to be considered pretty shallow. Other than that, being a temperate species, our waters warm pretty quickly. Um, once we get into April and May, longer days, um, as we kind of get through the end of March and get rid of kind of these seem like weekly cold fronts that you get pushed down for a few days um, that just kind of slow that process. By the time we hit May and June, most of these walleye are going to seek refuge back out in the deeper water, looking for offshore humps, islands, channel ledges. Um, but again, because they're not in great abundance, bank anglers really don't have access to them most of the year, walleye especially. Sagai, you're going to get a longer window um, in both the spring and the fall to be able to catch sawgai from the bank. Walleye are much more prevalent as far as being caught 
um, 10 months out of the year from boats, trolling, um, getting out into open water, marking them with electronics and things like that. So uh, for walleye anglers, your, your windows right now, um, Canton is a good one, Foss, uh, some of the Southwestern lakes will have walleye in them, but they're predominantly stocked with sawgye and sawgye are going to be pushing into the shallow waters just after what uh, the true walleye will do. Um, but right now at Canton, that's really kind of our premier walleye fishery. So for bank anglers looking to target walleye, um, this is the month to do it. And it's going to be all along the dam. Uh, Canton's got pretty good bank access along the dam. Um, as far as for different abled body people, uh, they do have these parking areas that are across the road on the dam and they have kind of a shallow, uh, light grade down to get to kind of these fishing jetties that are built out so you can get a wheelchair down um then there's also all of the riprap which for more adventurous people you can you know walk the riprap and pretty much access every portion of the dam if you want to and that's really going to be the hot ticket for walleye in the state every year is going to be middle of march to middle of april at canton along the dam uh, there really is no better public access for the quantity and quality of fish that you can get into. And that's also why the walleye rodeo is there every May. Um, it's a big national draw and that's, they kind of target them after that spawning period when the fish have moved back out. So it's boating anglers having the most success during the walleye rodeo. But now's the time to look for that as we kind of push into the end of March and get into April. That's really when those saw guy will start to turn on. Um, and you're going to find them in much more abundance in multiple bodies of water across the state, especially in the western half of the state. Um, they're pretty heavily stocked uh, as crappie management and then as well as recreation for anglers. Um, Hefner uh, in central, here right in Oklahoma City, they do have kind of a fluctuating walleye population. It seems that you'll have kind of this ebb and flow of good and bad shoreline walleye fish fishing and that typically comes towards the end of march into april it's usually kind of peak walleye for bank anglers at hefner is going to be early to middle half of april and it is most prevalent in the main in the main marina right there at the golf course um those fish will push into the back of the marina um as they run through their spawning cycle and there's a very consolidated window when there are when it is a good year of fish where you can get into them pretty good for about a week and then it's over with um, out. Then it's back out to the main lake on boats, trying to target those fish on the humps and channel edges along the lake. Um, but saw guy give us a much better, um, much better potential uh, and they're abundant throughout the state um, for the most part. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about. Um, the walleye just wanted to touch on that. All of these fishing tips that we'll go through today are going to work on walleye. Um, the one main difference between the walleye and the saw guy might be preferable prey species. So really the big difference is not so much the lure um, that you're using, but mainly the color. With walleye, you're really focusing on um, kind of these fluorescent backs to these hard lures or soft lures. Purple in particular tends to be a um, usually tends to be the number one color when it comes to walleye fishing, whether it be the backs of hard baits or soft plastic grubs, ringworms, um, little trick worms, anything like that. It's, it's purple is kind of going to be the winner, purple and blue, pink and blue. Um, and uh, because they have the DNA in them, you know, walleye are not native to Oklahoma, they were stocked here. So through generations of, um, breeding these fish, they're still going to have some of these baseline instincts to target perch um, that make up a main portion of their diet in their native waters, yellow perch. And you're going to see lures for that that are labeled primarily as fire tiger. And they're going to look pretty much like what yellow perch look like in the wild. And it's going to be that color pattern with that green back, um, the vertical dark banding through the middle of the bait and then orange to yellow or red on the underside of the bait in the middle of the bait. And you can get this in soft plastic and hard plastics. It's typically labeled as fire tiger. And that's going to be the other 
a main color scheme to look at when you're targeting walleye is going to be that fire tiger mixed in with things that are somewhat of like a purple nature something like this where you have that kind of shiny translucent underbelly with a dark purple back or just a straight grub and we'll go through the different types of baits here momentarily and talk about hard baits versus soft baits um, versus live bait and when and where you might look to use those in the state when you go to target these fish uh, so uh let's get into uh the hard baits first and work our way to the soft plastics um Hard baits are really good for walleye and sawgye when you're on a boat because you control these deep um, areas with them. But as they push up into the shallow water at this time of year, they are a good bait, especially the bigger hard baits that can land you some more substantial fish. Like I said earlier, most of our fish are going to range kind of in the 8 to 16, 18 inch range um, for walleye and sawgye. The walleye are going to run a little bit on the bigger side. Um, just because stocking efforts for walleye is very minimal. So we have naturally now existing walleye populations where they've been stocked previously. So you're typically going to get into bigger size range of fish more often than not, more like a 14 to 22 inch range. And those sagai, just depending on wh when they were originally stocked as fingerlings, um, kind of the longer back we go, you get into that sweet spot of like five to eight years after stocking and you'll really start to see some um, significant, you know, size differences of the sawgai versus other lakes that are maybe only two or three years into a really good fingerling stocking. Um, those fish are going to be, tend to be on a little bit of the smaller side, but we did lower the statewide limit. Um, there are a few lakes that still hold an 18 inch minimum or a 16 inch minimum, but the new statewide uh, for the last five years or so has gone back to 14 inches. So you're going to see a lot of the walleye and sawgye falling into kind of that 14 to 18 inch range across the state. Um, so with hard baits, anytime you're looking for walleye or sawgye shoreline of lakes and you're utilizing hard bait presentations, they're going to be more the long slender type as opposed to your more square bill, short stubby bass type crankbaits. Um, they're going to be deeper diving. Uh, the big thing in any type of walleye, sawgye, sauger fishing is contact with the bottom. So they are a bottom feeding fish. Um, not to say they're eating off of the bottom, but they that is kind of the area that they live. So no matter where they're at, as far as depth is concerned, they're always going to be hanging out in the bottom third of the water column. Um, so being able to bang hard baits with bills on them to dive down to those ranges, that's why it's so efficient with trolling because you're able to get it down to that maximum depth and maintain that. Whereas when you're fishing from the bank, you're essentially fishing back uphill towards you. Um, so you're trying to locate fish that are either off transition structure like points or the dam where you'll have these steep drop off areas and in, into bigger holes or, you know, rocky kind of lay downs that you'll get when you drop off of these points kind of out into the open water. And that's where these fish are going to look to congregate on the windblown side of the lakes. And you can get a um, diving crankbait down to them pretty effectively. Um, the main thing with these long slender baits and these flashier colors, your purples, your chartreuses, blues and orange, those are going to be, you're really looking for bright colored lures. Um, the way that walleye and sawgye, their eyes, um, being more of a nocturnal feeding fish for shallow water, they push up into the shallows to feed, um, in the nighttime for the most part, um, outside of their spawning run, will they'll push up into that shallow water. So, um, when you're trying to access them during daylight hours or in the morning hours, kind of the two hours on either side of dawn and dusk is really what you're looking for, for peak fishing, um, really at any time of year when you're going for walleye and sawgye, but especially as we get into this kind of peak window, which is March through May, um, being able to dive a build bait to that transition area and then work it back uphill towards you. You can cover a lot of the water um, depths 
to figure out where those fish are kind of at in that, but you know that they're going to be down anchored on the bottom. So get maintaining contact with the bottom is paramount and sometimes casting a jig um, with the soft plastic. So a quarter ounce, a half ounce jig. Sometimes you find a lot more hangups that way you get wedged in between rocks and it's just difficult to slow down your retrieve to where you can feel that jig head bouncing on the bottom and then ultimately you're hit. It can be a bit of a grinding process as far as fishing is concerned with artificial lures because you're getting the sensation of bites dragging a bait down along the bottom. Um, and then there's going to be the inevitable snags and hangups that can cause frustration. Um, so utilizing a bait like this, it's going to have all these treble hooks on it. Some of them are going to be dual. A lot of them are going to be triple. Um, where is a triple one at? So some like these shad wraps, these deep divers are going to have those three treble hooks on them. What I like to do with walleye lures is a lot of times, and this is kind of impractical, but if you know where fish are at, um, taking the hooks off of the bait. So finding a good color that you like to use, you take those hooks off, run this thing and bang it along the bottom. You have almost zero chance of getting snagged. You could still potentially wrap your line around something. But if you start getting bit on that, um, what I'll do is I'll just replace the back. So I'll take the entire hook and the uh, kind of O-ring that it's on that they clamp onto the bait. And I'll leave that back one on there and just remove the treble and replace it with kind of a small to medium size straight shank hook. Something that's less likely to get hung up on the bottom because it's now up in the air like this and this bait is meant to be dove down to the bottom and this just looks like a feeding bait fish kind of vacuuming the uh, lake bed as it goes up so you can leave that treble on the back if you like but removing the front one for sure those walleye are more than likely going to hit it from the side or from the back and you really only need that rear treble to do the damage um, you know you have the multiple hooks on it so that when <clears throat> fish take side swipes or front strikes at the bait it just gives you extra hook points to potentially grab the fish by the face plate um but baits like these are going to be some of the most expensive hard baits that you can buy <clears throat> and you know getting these hung up when you're on the bank the odds of getting them back is you know slim to none so a good way to conserve your real expensive hard baits and make some use out of them from the bank is just removing the front treble hook and leaving the rear or removing the rear and replacing it with a small to medium size <coughs> straight shank hook like this. And a lot of times with that, you can tip the back of the bait with a night crawler or a minnow, give a little scent and extra. So you get the flash, the rattle, all the stimulation of the hard bait to get the attention of the fish. And then you can pair a straight shank hook that's less likely to get hung up or the treble hook itself with a night crawler or a minnow, um, which are going to be your two primary live baits. Um, you don't see leeches sold a lot here, but leeches are also another good live bait for walleye in particular. So just a few of these different type hard baits. These are kind of the common color schemes that you'd be looking for um, if you're going to be running hard hard baits. And the one key takeaway is that they're long slender baits. Um, they typically have deep diving bills. So you're going to have these big long bills. Some of them are going to be protruded more downward to really dive those things into 20, 30 feet of water. But most of these are great for getting into that kind of 10 to 20 range as you pull up into the eight, six range, as you're coming back to the bank and you're going to find the sweet spot in there eventually. But purples and pinks, always going to be good walleye colors as well as sawgai, um, but more so for the walleye. And then some lighter colors, your blues with your orange bellies, which this is going to catch a lot of different types of species. Um, this is going to mimic, you know, a lot of shad patterns that are out there. So you're going to pull up bass and, um, you know, an occasional catfish with a bait like this. More on the light side, so in real turbid water, you might look for something like this that's still got that purple and pink and kind of neon flash with it, but it's more of a lighter faded color. That's going to perform pretty well in the more turbid water when fish lose that coloration. And then real brights, your oranges, chartreuses, golds, 
But long and slender, divers, big tip, take the treble hook off the front and either leave the rear or replace it with the straight shank hook and tip that with um, some live bait just for extra enticement. And that's going to be a really good combo if you want to take the hard bait route. Other less popular, but sometimes very effective, just depending on um, the water depth that fish might be holding in, um, are going to be like lipless crankbaits, which are, I'm a big, big fan, big advocate of lipless crankbaits for bank anglers because they are a hard bait that you can control the depth the best because the depth is based on the weight of the lure along with your retrieve speed. So very easy to tailor your fishing presentation, very quickly cover a lot of water. They're great search baits. Um, and in the cases of like saw guy, you're going to find, you know, when they get up shallow and they're looking to target crappie throwing silver flashy, you know, just basic lipless crankbaits like a rattle trap um, or any of the other brands um, of what they call their lipless crankbaits. Strike King has, um, their brand, uh, Krem, Bass Pro is going to have their own generic model. Uh, but again, you're sticking to kind of the flashier colors, something in the golds and the, the blues and chartreuses. Um, you might even find some success, at least if you're looking to kind of get in on multi-species with something more in a red pattern with that chartreuse built into it, but can't ever go wrong with just basic silver, uh, I really like the eighth ounce uh, Bill Lewis mini trap. The only problem with these guys, and this is just a good overall lake bait or river bait. It's an eighth ounce, great size profile, about an inch and a half, two inch body. So perfect dynamite bait size. Um, the only knock on these is right out of the box factory. These are kind of thin wire hooks and you can straighten them out on bigger fish. Uh, if you get snagged, a lot of times you're able to retrieve your lure with them though, because it'll bend the hook back and then you can pop the hook point back into place with pliers, but great, great overall, like go to the lake, make a lot of casts, catch a lot of different fish um, is going to be just a one eighth ounce uh, silver rattle trap. But for the most part, most saw guy walleye anglers are sticking to those longer slender body profiles um, either in a, a purple or something like a yellow and a chartreuse in red or in that fire tiger perch pattern. Um, but rattle traps or lipless crankbaits are just a great um, lure for search baits for ang uh, hard baits for bank anglers. They're just, they're really you know, quality color. Uh, jerk baits. Jerk baits can be effective uh, in that shallow water. They're, they have the perfect bait profile and they're a suspending deal. So you can rattle them in front of fish and they either slowly rise, suspend um, or slowly fall, but you can get them in, you know, that perfect color. So something like this, these rip stops by Rapala, um, this is just a classic little jerk bait. You can fish them real slow. You don't need to pause and pop them. Um, this will get down to a depth of, you know, maybe four to eight feet somewhere in there, which when you're fishing from the bank and those fish are up shallow, that is perfect depth range to get into. Um, because if you get the ones that are suspending or rising, if you happen to hit the bottom and you feel yourself at the bottom and you didn't find a snag, you can allow that bait to float up quite a ways before you either pause and pop it again, or just a very slow retrieve with this and that very small bill you're going to get just a real tight wobble through the water. So you get the flash, you get that color, you essentially can fish it like a crankbait um, when they're up shallow, but it's a great size profile and uh, you get some really good color patterns out of these rip stops, but most jerk baits will come in an assortment of patterns. Um, here's another one. This is a real good one that I like of a, of a jerk bait profile bait that you can fish as a straight crankbait by just slowly retrieving it. Um, but this is a really dynamite color scheme with that chartreuse on the underside, iridescent through the middle and that nice purple back. So jerk baits often overlooked, not really talked about when you're saw guy or walleye fishing, but what we're trying to accomplish all as anglers is essentially mimic as closely as we can what they favor as food sources. 
Um, and in the case of these fish, it's going to be those long, slender type lures as they look to attack minnows and small shad. And then for sawgai looking at crappie, so sawgai might have a better eye for kind of more of a thicker profile bait. You can get back into kind of the bass style crankbaits while they'll also target the long slender one. So with sawgai, you're really getting that happy medium between sauger, which are very difficult to catch because it's hard to locate them a lot of the times. Um, and walleye that just aren't as abundant, those sawgai are really good happy medium. You can catch them on a lot more different baits where walleye tend to be a little bit more specific in what they're going after. But minnows and night crawlers for um, walleye especially. So we'll kind of talk about how you'll rig up live bait as we as we go along. Some other jerk bait colors that we have. Um, you get that red with that chartreuse back which mimics our bigger diving crankbait. And we have just this for our jerkbait. So get a lot of similar colors, good, good size profile. And then a lesser used, but you can certainly find some success with some saw guy, especially, um, especially if you're a bass angler um, and you're looking to maybe try to catch some pre-spawn bigger bass that might've pushed up shallow along with saw guy that could be, pushing in there around the same times are going to be your bladed jigs, flashy colors, reds, chartreuses, oranges. Um, most of the bladed jigs that you're going to find on the market at big stores or just the mom and pop bait stores are going to be just the original Z-Man chatterbait, which is what this is. They got the nice big um, blade on the front. You get a lot, you move a lot of water, you make get that good vibration, but you can work these down along the bottom really well without the worry of hang up. So pairing these with a um, pairing like a white jig or a chartreuse jig um, with something like this for your soft plastic gets getting something like this as a trailer. You're going to get that nice flash. So you can put this in with a white um, bladed jig or a chartreuse one something like that, but very, very less commonly used. Um, but they certainly have, um, the potential on lakes that maybe get heavy pressure to be just a different, um, kind of sonic signature that are being given off by the bait. And so sometimes that's what it takes on heavily pressured waters, but something that's overlooked jerk baits and bladed jigs where you're fishing in good location. Those fish are down on the bottom. You can pair them with uh, good colored soft plastics, you have a good size range as well as good color ranges, um, which is what you're looking for. So uh, at any time, you know, when you're looking for fish like this, that can be particular with color, um, having a lot of different options of types of baits that are all essentially mimicking the same things, just giving off a little bit different signature uh, in the water based on sound appearance, all of that. So that's really what you're looking for when it comes to the, to the hard baits. Um, from the bank, you like throwing hair jig, hair type jigs or hard baits more. I mean, honestly, I'm, if I'm fishing from the bank for walleye or saga, I'm probably favoring more towards a soft plastic on a jig head um, just because it's a cheap, effective way to target fish. Part of fishing on the bottom, especially as a bank angler where you are fishing uphill and sometimes severely uphill, especially if you're fishing off of big transition areas like points or dams, um, you're going to get snagged. It's just, it's an inevitability when you're trying to bang down along the bottom. Um, and it's just a more effective cost, uh, for anglers to utilize cheap round jig heads with cheap soft plastics that are in these same color schemes. So that's, that's really what you're looking to use. And that's why with the hard baits, I just recommend taking those front trebles off because they're expensive and you're trying to get down to the bottom. So with hair jigs, um, just depending on the color and, you know, you can pair a hair jig, especially the bigger bass style ones with a trailer a soft plastic trailer, and you're essentially accomplishing the same thing. But again, depending on the type of hair jig that it is and the brand, you know, it could be similarly priced to a, um, hard bait, whereas pack of jig heads, pack of plastic grubs going to run you five bucks, six bucks. Um, and you got plenty that you need to go out. 
in fish. So then it really just becomes a size range profile. Uh, when you use soft plastic baits, you see these hard baits, they're these big size profiles. You know, you're talking about baits like this that are going to be in that four, five, six inch range when it's all said and done from the build to the tip. But because you have those treble hooks and thing, things like that on the bait, when you do get a short strike or you get an exploratory strike, you tend to hook up because you have those uh, treble hooks. But with soft plastics, we're kind of looking to do the opposite. You're really looking to downsize as much as possible and really find that smallest range of what the majority of those fish are looking um, to attack. And oftentimes that's just a two inch soft plastic three inch soft plastic. Um, but anglers have a tendency, you see walleye, saga, you see these bigger fish being caught. Um, and the natural instinct is you need to be throwing a bigger bait profile, which is true. If you throw a big four, five, six inch soft plastic, you're pretty much eliminating those smaller fish. Um, you are only targeting the trophy fish. And on some days they are willing to give take at those real big size profiles but more often than not most game species in the state are feeding on very small prey sources um body size is less than three inches and so when you stick to that not only are you opening up the amount of fish that you can potentially catch in a day but you're certainly leaving open the spectrum of the fish that you can catch there's nothing preventing a very large fish from taking a very small bait um, but you're going to eliminate a lot of those, you know, potential eater fish that are 14, 15, 16 inches from going after a five, six inch <coughs> soft plastic that's got a single point hook on it. So it can get struck, but a lot of times you're just getting short struck. They're hitting the back end of the bait. They don't get up over the hook point. You get bit a lot. It gets frustrating. You're not seeing the hookup success that you'd like to, that you ultimately get with the hard baits when they take a swipe at that <coughs> just because of the multiple hooks that you have. So soft plastics, you're really looking into kind of like three or four types of soft plastics. Um, curly tail grubs and kind of the hybrid, uh, hybrid type grub style baits. So now they make these grub style baits that will have paddle tails or bumper tails on them, twin flickering curly tails, um, any of those I'm going to kind of lump into the grub category and that's a really good starting base, especially for walleye, like up at Canton looking for like a three, two to three inch purple grub on an eight ounce jig head. That's really going to be your dynamite range. And it's going to be fairly similar for saw guy across the state. Um, as you get into smaller saw guy lakes that are newer in the stocking, um, plan of saw guy, you might downsize all the way to like baby shad. Um, utilizing like an inch and a half, two inch body profile on a one sixteenth ounce jig head, a one thirty second ounce jig head, just slowly working that along the bottom. Um, but a real good kind of tried and true standard range of what you're looking for is a three inch bait profile, a purple curly tail grub, eighth ounce jig head to pair it with. That's a really good combo. It's going to be effective on most um, walleye and saw guy lakes when you can get those fish that are near shore and you can cast to them. So with the grubs, so this is going to be on the smallest size of the grub profiles. And these are going to be baits that you're going to find more likely in the panfish or crappie section um, of your bait and tackle store. And these are going to be just that two, two and a half inch profile, but the pinks and the purples, just little grubs like this. These are going to be great on like a 16th ounce or a 132nd ounce jig head. You can certainly throw them on a 1 8th if there's lots of current or wind um, or you need to cast out farther an 8th ounce taking a small bait profile, heavier jig head. You still have enough body length on this for most standard um, jig heads. So for example, a quarter ounce jig head is gonna be just a shade too big. So the hook shank on this quarter ounce jig head to the base, you need to be pulling out that hook point, especially on these dual molded baits where the tail is separated from the actual body and it's joined from the melting process when they make the bait. You can sometimes get a, they're 
a little bit of like the body down on here on the tail that you can pop out that hook point. But typically you want to be coming out between those first and second ribs down at the base of the bait. And that quarter ounce jig head for these real small baits is typically going to be too big. Um, like fireball jigs that they make, they're not going to have a collar on them. Um, so your bait can slip on it, but they're a short shanked um, hook that are meant to be fished with like live minnows or night crawlers. You can kind of get away with something like that, but typically an eight ounce jig head is going to be effective with just about any size of your soft plastic range. So let's find a eighth ounce jig head here and pairing from the collar to the turn is, is very, very close. You can work that on there and, and pull that out when you put these jig heads through your soft plastics, especially curly tail grubs. You go in through the tip of the nose and when you come out, you want to be coming out hook point side matching the tail. So the hook point's going to come out on the tail side that's facing outward. And you can pretty much work that right down to where the tail and the body are joined. Work that up above the collar of the jig head. And it's going to sit on there pretty flush. That's what you're looking for. If you come out too short, it's going to be dangling off the bottom. Your hook point's going to be up too high. But this is great. You're not going to get short struck on this. Fish comes up and gets it. It's more than likely getting over the hook point. So you get that nice big jig head eighth ounce, get it down on the bottom and run that, but you get the smaller bait profile, which more often than not is going to get you bit more often. It's not going to eliminate the big fish, um, but more often than not, you're just going to get bit more consistently. So pinks and chartreuses, um, purples, if you can get purple and chartreuse or all purple, um, if you're going after um, sogai, monkey milk is the uh, color that most brands label these kind of pearl white that have the black flakes through it, that's going to be a great little crappie imitator right there. So Sogai will go in and attempt to spawn along with walleye earlier than crappie do. So they'll go through, they'll run their shallow spawning cycle. And then after that, they're going to go into kind of the post spawn feeding gorge, which can be more prolific um, than the pre-spawning period. So when those fish push up, all spawning fish, they're not really active in feeding when they're engaged in their spawning process. They're just looking, they gorge themselves to get all the calories to get through the process. They exhaust themselves during the process, but they're not feeding. And then once the process is concluded, after resting for a short period of time, they will basically go back into this feeding gorge that'll happen. And for sagai, that typically tends to line up with the crappie spawn. So you can get real good multi-species action in these shallow coves that have sagai when those crappie are coming in. So you can catch crappie, get out there in the late afternoon, catch a bunch of crappie, um, crappie that are not actively in the process of being on the beds are going to retreat out to deeper water at night. They do that year round um, to avoid shallow nocturnal predators like sagai, like largemouth bass, like catfish. So those crappie are going to be trying to catch those um, those saga would be trying to catch those crappie as the ones that are pushing back out into that deeper water for the night to suspend in school. So utilizing, you know, something in that monkey milk color is going to be dynamite after a day of crappie fishing. So you might fill up a bucket full of crappie. You get kind of right to sunset that hour after sunset, you may pick up a limit of really good saga in the exact same area, just depending on the body of water. But that is really what they're going to be keying on as we get later into the year. Right now, you're going to have a mixed bag of what their prey source is. Your crappie are more than likely going to be either on transition structure or depending on the lake with water temperatures, they could still be out in wintering habitat, which is going to be way out deep. They're going to be suspended up off the bottom. So those sagai, you know, they're not going to get to them. Those sagai are down along the bottom. As we work our way into April, even into May, northern parts of the state, you're going to get that crossover of those sagai coming back out from going shallow to attempt a spawning cycle. Those crappie pushing up and moving back each day until they decide that they're ready to spawn. And those sagai are going to take advantage of that. So targeting waters where you're crappie fishing, monkey milk is going to be a solid color in addition to the more traditional pinks, purples, real purple and blue, those types of colors. Um, 
Nether, these are going to be more of the hybrid style grubs. Um, these are going to have that grub body to them, and they're going to be affixed with instead of a curly tail, they'll have that bumper tail on the back. June bug, you're getting that nice purple and chartreuse. That's always going to be a good color scheme. Um, the kind of pearl pink is going to be another good one. Um, and then your pinks and chartreuses. And then here's a monkey milk with chartreuse. That's going to be good one. So sticking to colors like those, but not to say that you're not going to catch them on like a straight orange or a <clears throat> more natural color, like a white, straight white, white and chartreuse, straight um, brown or a green pumpkin, something like that. That's just that black and chartreuse. That's This will probably pick up a lot more bycatch get little bass on stuff like that. But those are again, going to be found in your pan fish sections, crappie sections of your local retailer. So that's a good place to start to get those small, um, baits. Uh, where else? Here's some of, well, we'll do the small baits first and then we'll do the bigger ones. So then the next real small option of your pan fish are going to be your baby shad. Um, and in that your Bobby Garland's your locally are going to be probably your popular bait choice, but they do make a couple of real bang up colors, um, that you can get into those walleye and saw guy with something like this, that nice dark purple back with that crimson maroon. That's a, I mean, that color scheme right there is going to be dynamite on walleye and getting this real small um, profile. It's a two inch body um, from tip to tail, but it's really more like an inch, inch and a half body profile up here on the top. Your hook point on a, you know, one thirty second ounce, one sixteenth ounce jig head is going to pull out right here on the flat side, right before the base of the tail. So the great thing about these Bobby Garlands with this real soft plastic is that these, they just pulse. That tail is just always moving. So you really don't need to work these through the water very fast, which is ideal in the colder water temperatures. If you can slow down your retrieve speed and bang something like this down along the bottom, I do find quite a bit of success with um, kind of that 14 to 18 inch saw guy range utilizing something like this and again it's just not really a common um used bait or at least discussed bait when it comes to walleye and saw guy fishing but you're going to get that monkey milk color to match with your crappie fry so something like that can be real bang up if you're getting those saw guy up there right as the crappie spawn is concluding and males are up there guarding these fry, you're going to have a ton of fish for about a month that are swimming around these coves that look pretty close to that. So um, Bobby Garland's baby shad, not overly used, but they have some great color schemes um, in a real good small profile and you can pair them all the way up to an eighth ounce jig head. So real good. Uh, as far as size profile and where you can get them depth in the water column, you're going to get all the benefits of the bigger baits, but you're going to get bit more often. You're going to be able to slow down the retrieve. That tail is going to be working for you. Uh, so simplistic. There's not a whole lot to it. Um, with grubs, it might be a retrieve speed, getting that tail moving right at the right motion for those fish to key in on it. Um, and then obviously there's other baits that require much more, action from the angler to get out of the bait whereas a baby shad is going to be fish fishes itself you just cast it out and just slowly retrieve it feel that jig head bang on the bottom uh so as we get into the bigger bait profiles things that are typically labeled as walleye um tackle or at least put into a section that's labeled as walleye or saw guy or perch um, just depending on what store you're in and where you're at in the state Ringtails are a pretty common um, soft plastic for walleye and saw guy, and they're going to look something like this. So these ringtails are essentially kind of a longer profiled, slender version of a grub without the long curly tail of a traditional like curly tail worm that you might use in bass fishing. So this 
this applies a lot of different good elements of several different soft plastics. The most popular being in today's soft plastic world, this ribbing that's through the side. It really gives off a good pulse in the water that very closely mimics the movement of pectoral and dorsal and tail fins of small bait fish. Um, very lifelike, very natural. Um, you're getting more of an organic bite as opposed to that reactionary bite by creating a lot of disruption in the water with the hard baits um, and even some of the soft plastics, depending on how you're fishing them. So with these ringworms, again, that tail side is going to be pointing in one direction like that. And it's normally with these, just depending on how they're molded and what the colors are, typically on any type of bait especially soft plastics where you're responsible for rigging the hook in it. It's not a hard bait that comes with the hooks already attached. Your darker side of the bait is going to be the top of the bait. So in fishing and with fish biology, fish are dark on the back, light on the underbelly. Lots of different colors, but always a darker color on the back, lighter on the underbelly. And what that is, is that darker color allows them to blend with the bottom from avian predators. So eagles, um, egrets, herons, um, any birds of prey that swoop down on the water to grab fish. So having that dark top matches them with the bottom and then vice versa for pre uh, underwater predators, whether it be fish or turtles or um, you know any type of amphibian or reptile, having the lighter underbelly when predators are underneath a prey species, that lighter color is going to blend in better with, you know, the open sky. You're going to have that, you know, very bright. There's not really a lot of um, things as far as contrast. And so having that lighter underbelly. So that applies to baits and soft plastics in particular, where that darker color of the bait is more often than not going to be on that top side. So with these, it just depends on the mold, but usually that tail is facing upward on one solid color on the top. So that's where you're going to look to pull your jig head out of. The one thing that I don't like about ringworms is that without specialty jig heads, longer hook shanks to get that um, hook point coming out more mid body, most of your jig heads are going to be up. It's going to split this bait into a third, which means two thirds of your soft plastic is behind your hook point. That is very easy to get bit all of the time without the hook fish ever getting up over the hook point, which can cause frustrations because you're getting bit. That's why downsizing, using things like baby shad, crappie style um, soft plastics, whether it be grubs or hybrid grubs, bumper tails, little swim baits. Putting that single point hook as far to the back of the bait is always going to lead to more hookups, not necessarily indicative of how often you're getting bit. Um, but again, very basic colors, chartreuse, purple, pink, um, and then some oranges and some kind of flashier colors with that kind of hot pink mixed in with like a yellow or a chartreuse. But those are all the colors that you're looking for. The grub box is going to look very similar to it. With grubs, you get that nice big long tail on it, but the actual bulk of the body is a shorter, so you get that hook point farther out, and you're going to find grubs that are in more of that three and four inch profile, but you're going to see very similar colors in this box as you did in the ring worm box. Uh, but something like this, like especially at Canton, little three inch grub, eighth ounce jig head, just that's a real dynamite cast and retrieve super easy to fish eight ounce jig head you're going to be coming out again kind of on that second rib from the tail maybe the third rib from the tail but that puts it right near the back of the bait as this swims through the water that tail stretches like this as it catches water and it flickers <clears throat> and that's what gets the attention of the fish but chartreuses oranges pinks purples eight ounce jig heads, maybe a 16th ounce jig head, maybe a quarter ounce jig head. Um, with the three inch grubs, you get a lot of versatility. You're going to be able to put a half ounce jig all the way up to a one thirty second ounce jig. The most practical practical is going to be the one eight um, jig head. So that's really what you're looking, you know, as far as just a 
generic standard to go by is a three inch grub, eight ounce jig head. When it comes to a soft plastic from there, you're going to, you know, tailor your fishing approach to what works best for you. Um, and then as you find, depending on the water that you're fishing at, you can really key in on maybe a particular color or size range. And that's the fun of fishing is really dialing that in, but a really good base starting point is going to be a eight ounce jig, three inch grub in a purple or a pink or a some type of color scheme like that. Then you have just your traditional uh, swim baits. They could be um, rib. They could be lifelike. Um, there's also some ringworms in this box, but paddle tail, bumper tail, swim baits. Again, I favor colors that are in more of this. So this is another real dynamite color scheme. You get all the good profiles. This is about the same size as that three inch grub. Um, your hook point is going to be coming out kind of right where the tail becomes a consistent size. It's going to be fatter up here on the body. So that hook point gets you to the back third of the bait. You got that nice big thumper tail. Um, these have really come a long way to really replace the grub as the next real kind of across the board um, fishing soft plastic. Forever, it was the three-inch grub that was pretty standard for most game species, whether it was bass or crappie or white bass or um, walleye, sogeye, any of those predator-type species was the three-inch grub, eighth-ounce jig head. Technology has brought us a long ways in a quick amount of time. We're starting to see these ribbed swim baits meant to be jig or rigged with a jig head just like a um, grub but you're just getting a lot more action out of a bait like this. So rib swim baits, real good innovation in fishing these days. Um, see that uh, kind of pearl pink. It's hard to see the pink with that light directly shining down, but these are going to be the two that I'm going to look to use to start off with when I size up. So if I'm getting steady fish on the baby shad or on one of the smaller grubs, if I'm looking to size up from there, one of my first go-tos is going to be just depending on the body of water that I'm at and the water color. It's going to be one of these two with an eighth ounce jig head, maybe a one sixteenth. These are a little bit heavier, so you'll get a better sink rate just from the bait alone. Um, then you have all these different kind of lifelike baits that, they make that you can also pair with jig heads that you'll find. There's going to be a never ending assortment of um, soft plastics and primarily in today's world, the any type of swim bait swim baits are really dominating kind of the soft plastic uh, genre within fishing tackle right now. You're going to see lots and lots and lots of rows filled with different types of swim baits, whether they're pre-rigged meant to be rigged with certain style hooks or just your traditional ball head jig, easy peasy out the bag, um, get you on the water catching fish. The last soft plastic, um, bag or box that we got and some more very basic grubs. Um, and then for jig heads, basic ball jig head but if you if you want to add some extra enticement to any of these baits going with a roadrunner head something with that underpin you get the flasher with it um, that can sometimes make a difference for pressured fish or finicky fish just giving that little bit extra flash so instead of a um, just basic round or minnow head shaped jig you get that roadrunner head or an underpin blade head Gives it a little extra flash, but you're going to rig them exactly the same. So pretty much it for the soft plastics. Um, you can try some like trick type worms. Things like this that you would see in bass fishing. They do make these in a few really good color schemes like this cotton candy or, a you know, a purple. Um, but here's a few different types of uh trick worms that you can Texas rig or throw on a jig head. You can get creative with baits like this, drop shot them, run them across. Not as effective to catch bait uh, or to catch the fish with as a hard bait or a three inch bait profile with the jig head, but 
for some people getting creative, catching fish in different ways, the trick worms will find fish. Um, they're the right color schemes. They're kind of the right size profile, a little bit longer, but much more slender. You can get, you know, some different bigger fish to come grab something like that. Um, you just, you can, you can rig those trick worms in so many different ways. It just kind of opens up, you know, a different pathway to, to reach fish. So that brings us into um, kind of our live bait. Um, you have your your harness crawlers, your crawler harnesses, which are going to be spinners. Um, they're typically trolled. It's not to say you can't cast them out and retrieve them all on the bottom with a no snag weight, but they're going to be sold um, different styles. Some of them will have the balls, um, with the jig or with the blades so other ones are going to kind of have more of a floating body so you'll have ones like this that have the the balls for flash along with the spinner this one you're going to have this floating body with the spinner and these uh they unwind out and essentially what you do is you rig a um, a night crawler to these and you have these two hooks on there so you rig the head of the, or one end of the worm up here, maybe wrap it a couple of times just to make sure it's secured onto that hook. And then same thing on the back, pinch it on the back, get it over the hook point, maybe wrap it once so that you're double hooked through. Um, and then the worm just hangs off the back. The flash gets the attention like this. Um, just like I was talking about with putting a single point hook on the back of a big hard bait where you could then pair that with like a night crawler. Same thing with these. These are really meant to be trolled. You fish them out in, you know, that open water, get them down on the bottom. But you could throw a, you know, Lindy rig type weight. So these no snag bottom bouncing weights that get drug along. And this would be, so they sell these and they come on these little swivels that you need to, directly tie your line onto. You could also use a snap swivel if you wanted to. I like to be directly tied on. And then you put this weight on. And when you put the weight on, you got to make sure that you're putting your line, your main line comes in through this way. So the seat of the weight is like that. If you put it on like this and go through this side, it's not going to drag across the bottom and it's going to get hung up and not do what it's supposed to. But anytime you're fishing from the bank, utilizing bottom bouncing presentations, odds are you're going to find a snag. Um, so from an effective standpoint, you might catch a lot of fish if you can stay on sandy or rocky bottom where there's just not a lot of snags, but you can also run into areas where you're going to lose three of these in a row. So, um, but night crawlers are a favorite of uh, walleye in particular, but you're going to catch saw guy with worms as well. And they also like minnows and leeches. And they make different rigs. So what I commonly will do if I'm fishing with live bait from the bank is I fish more like you're fishing for catfish where you're just straight fishing off the bottom. Um, and Lindy rigs are great for that. So a Lindy rig is essentially the same thing that we just showed. It just doesn't have the spinners with it. And it will come um, paired with one of those weights. Sometimes they will have single hooks. Other times they will have double hooks find one that's not wrapped up here so these are single hook ones and they come wrapped up again like this you just need to unwind them typically it's by utilizing um, the hook side so you'll pull the hook and unwind it a few times and then once you get to unwind it should come straight apart they're usually um, you know when they're wound sometimes they're not wound great and you will find ones that you just have don't pull them tight until you get them completely loose or you'll you'll get a knot in there and you don't want knots and things like this. So with these, with the single hook or a double hook, you can tie a trailer hook or a stinger hook onto it, like a treble hook off of the back of this. And they come with a, this half swivel. So they come with a swivel that looks like this, where you tie your main line up here and you put, your weight they'll come in 
typically two sizes in retailers here. It's going to be a half ounce or a quarter ounce. I always try to use the lightest weight possible. So if it's not windy or current, I'll utilize the quarter ounce. But if it's super windy or bad current, up to the half ounce and you go on like that. And then these swivels, instead of having a snap, it's just kind of wound on there. So these come with this loop on the end and you take that loop up to that little sticking out pin right there that works its way into that figure eight. And you just press it up against the side that the pin is on and then you just pull it tight and pull it down until it gets down to the center of the loop and then from there they stay on pretty good i've lost a few um, if that pin gets bent but most of the time it should be a little difficult to get it down that means it's snug if it's super easy to pull that thing down that pin might be offset a little bit and it does have the potential for either coming loose during a retrieve or casting it off. Doesn't happen very often, but does have the potential for that. Um, so when you'd be rigged up on this, let's get this unwound. And you put your bait, either your minnow or your night crawler. You get this nice long leader line that's made for walleye. Um, so it's a thicker monofilament, real good pound test, probably like 14 pound test, at least 12. Um, so real good break strength on this. So you can tie this to a main line on maybe a medium action setup that's got like six or eight pound test on it, probably closer to eight or 10. Um, six is a little light if you hit a big fish, but you get this nice big thick leader. Um, so you don't need to be mainlined with a ton of weight, which is extra feel for when you're fishing off the bottom to indicate any type of bites. But you just put your weight on the main line and then tie to the singular eye hole. And then you would just pair this. You'd tip it with a, with a night crawler or a red worm or a leech or a minnow. And you just let that sit and you just cast that, you know, off of wherever the bank that you're fishing from and cast it out, you know, you're going to try different depths and different uh, distances from the bank. So start off at the farther distance and then just slowly reel up. If you're not getting bit after about five minutes, you know, reel up a few, few yards and then leave it there and keep doing that until you get all the way back to the shoreline. And if you do that a few times, maybe there's not fish in the area. It's a good time to go try a new spot, but that's pretty easy when it comes to um, bank fishing. So, Utilizing a Lindy rig, you can obviously make your own either with a leader or just tie directly a hook on your main line and then affix a weight up however you like to utilize a bottom, bottom bouncing uh, rig. But from, from the shoreline, you know, the real big game comes into play right now for walleye through March, early April, and then the saw guy into April and May. And that's utilizing the artificials. And that's what most of these webinars are tailored to is getting use out of your artificial lures when they are the most effective and when you can fish them from the shoreline. Because most times a year, you're fishing out in deeper water off of the transition area. So if you're fishing off the dam or you're fishing off big fishing jetties or points or docks that extend well out into the water, um, live bait, you know, most of the year, that's just, we're trying to mimic what's natural um, with these artificials and their peak window to get action with them where it is more cost effective as well as it's more angling effective to use these artificials. That's the window that we're in. Um, and for bank anglers, the value that you're going to get from a cheap jig head and cheap bag of 20, 50 soft plastics is going to get the most bang for your buck. Um, as well as something cheap like a bottom bouncing rig, like a Lindy rig, or just making your own, um, and then tipping it with a getting a bucket of minnows or a cup of night crawlers and utilizing that. And in some cases, you might do both. Um, you always want to up your odds. So having a rod that's next to you that's thrown out with bait and then allowing you to basically fan cast on either side of where you have your bait at um, and use those artificials and see if there is a difference. Sometimes those fish are going to key in on eating that night crawler or eating that minnow 
Other days it's going to be, hey, there's no point in having the live bait out there. The fishing is the action so good with artificials. And that's really what you look for at this time of year because it's kind of the only time that it happens. With Sagai, we do see it again in the fall. Um, late October into November, usually that full moon around uh, the end of October, early November really peaks the fall gorge for those Sagai before they go out into their winter patterns. So you do get that prolonged um, bite into the fall that you get with other species like a largemouth bass um, that tend to gorge themselves before they um, go into the winter months. With that, see, uh, I don't see any more questions on there. Um, kind of talk about some some public areas to go where you'd look to be successful. The great thing about walleye and sawgye, unlike our crappie presentations or our bass presentations, where there's just such a broad assortment of lures um, and tackle choices that that typically takes up the entire two hours. Walleye and saw guy is pretty basic. Um, you know, curly tail grubs or ringworms um, or long slender hard baits. I mean, if you're sticking to one of those three, you're probably in a good starting position to really refine your um, walleye and saw guy fishing from there. Now, as far as sauger are concerned, the Arkansas River right now is kind of the place to catch them. Um, up in the Tulsa area, looking for public access areas beneath bridges. Um, you're going to get those deep uh, holes that are dredged out. The big thing with those sauger is water flow. So if the water is too elevated, you can't get to them. And if it's not moving enough, it won't push fish into kind of these active feeding patterns. So you're really looking for kind of water levels, how they have it right now, um, where there's just a little bit of release from Keystone Dam, just enough to move the water somewhere in that 600 CFS range, 800 CFS range. You start to get over a thousand, it's, you know, it gets hard to fish. And if it's under, you know, four two, 400, somewhere in there. It's typically not enough flow to really have them actively biting, but we are in that peak window. Sauger, that bite does not last for very long. Um, so if you're looking to target Sauger this year, if you live in the Tulsa area, um, up in that kind of general range, or if you live in Oklahoma city and you're just looking for a day trip on a weekend to go fish, you're going to have a bunch of white bass mixed in right now. So it's a good multi-species time, um, to target Sauger because you, you'll find areas where you should see schooling white bass mixed in, um, especially the farther downstream from uh, kind of the jinx area that you go, you're going to find white bass looking to hit up a lot of those feeder tributaries that come in through the Tulsa Metro and dump into the Arkansas, just Southeast, I guess, of, of jinx um, of the Creek turnpike bridge. Uh, but there's lots of public access along the Arkansas river. Um, right there in Tulsa, lots of the river walk. So you could access quite a bit of river publicly um, moving up and down. And that's where you're looking to fish little small soft plastic swim baits, um, purples, blue backs, uh, blue and chartreuse is, is my preferred color. I think it just does such a good job of mimicking um, shad and minnow species and most of our fish here in Oklahoma, they just, they really key in on that, that blue and chartreuse color. So something in kind of this pattern where you have that lighter or darker blue back, each brand is going to be a little different. Sometimes it's labeled as bluegrass. Sometimes it's labeled as blue chartreuse. Every brand has a different name for it, but um, baits like these, and these, and these are kind of on the lighter side as far as the chartreuse is concerned on the underbelly. But when these are underwater, that blue back mixed with that chartreuse just does a real good job of mimicking shad and other natural minnow sources that they see quite often. So it's a really, really good color scheme for all species here in Oklahoma. But particularly when you get into the, the white bass, the sogeye, sauger, um, and white bass. Um, and crappie. Those are, that's just a really, really good color scheme. So if you want to go hit up the Arkansas river, now's the time to do it for those sauger and looking as a base color, something like that is going to put you on a good footing to start with. If there's fish that are actively feeding, um, from walleye kind of addressed it earlier on, um, of, um, Canton kind of being the, the big game that we have here in the state. Um, 
right now for the next month, the dam at Canton is really going to be the most access to an abundant population of walleye. You get into other areas of the state where walleye have been stocked and have a naturally occurring population. The abundance, where they go, um, I mean, you look at a lake like Hefner that's not very big. Um, there's no inflow. Those fish don't have anywhere to go. And it's still fairly difficult to locate good numbers of walleye year in, year out from the bank. And that's just because populations just go up and down based on a lot of factors. The main one being walleye are not native to Oklahoma. And unlike a lot of introduced species, because they are more of a temperate, um, they prefer the cooler water temperatures. They just don't do very well in Oklahoma. Um, so they don't reproduce quite as well. They, you know, their abundance, their size growth. You see a lot of limiting factors which we really make up for with the sawgai. The sawgai do incredibly well. Their reproduction is limited because they are hybrid fish, so there is a lot of sterilization. Um, but you will get some natural reproduction. And because we stock them, and we stock them on an annual basis um, with rotating lakes, we have a constant influx of these fish. And as those bases grow, um, as we're seeing, Oklahoma will continue to evolve into a very, very good sawgai fishing state. Um, we're just starting to see the returns um, in the southwestern part of the state over the last several years. Um, that's really kind of our hot spot for sawgai right now is our southwestern lakes. Most of them, if not all, have been stocked with uh, sawgai. Altus Lugert has walleye in it. Um, but your Ellsworth and Humphreys and Duncan and Clear Lake and Mountain uh, Lake. There's so many lakes down there that are not heavily fished. They don't get a lot of the same press that the Southeastern and Eastern lakes get or a Texoma gets um, as far as fishing pressure. There are, you know, lots of local that will go out there and target the different species that they key in on, whether it be crappie or white bass or um, black bass species or the sawgai. Um, but those are the real prevalent ones. They're going to have big populations of sawgai as well as some of the larger fish that you can find in the state. Lake Thunderbird here in the central part of the state, just south of Oklahoma City, down around Norman. That was one of our pilot lakes for sawgai um, back in the 80s, I believe, either late 70s or into the 80s. So it's been, you know, almost four decades since those fish were put in there. And there are some giant sawgai in that lake um that lake definitely has one of the better potentials of spitting out a new state record there's certainly an abundance of the fish in there lots of different size classes they've obviously had reproduction in there over the years and it will continue to get stocked probably every five to seven years with fingerlings um just as we rotate stockings on major reservoirs throughout the state um that's a good one in just central oklahoma um the coves down around um, Little River State Park, Lake Thunderbird, Little River, um, Discovery Point. There's five coves that work in through that public access. That's really the best public bank access um, on the lake. And you get good crappie that push up. There's lots of great transition structure. The Little River comes in on the western edge of the lake. And it basically runs all the way down to the dam right along those coves. So not only do you have the big main river channel, which your bigger predators are going to favor most of the year. You have these big long points that go out to those drops that lead into really prime spawning habitat um, for both sawgai and crappie. So typically when we get into the middle of April, you're going to start to see those crappie get in there pretty good. And with them are going to be the sawgai. So you get, that's one of the places that comes to mind that you get a really good multi-species bite. You get those crappie during the daylight hours. You start to push into the later evening, into the, just after um, dusk, you can really get into like some substantial fish in good quantities of both crappie and then going into the sawgai. Um, Northwestern part of the state, Foss, Canton, they're going to have the walleye in it. And then sawgai are being implemented into different states. Um, big thing with like fisheries management is you obviously, you want to try to uh, have a healthy predator to prey base. Sawgai are voracious predators. Um, we use them as a management tool on lakes that have these overabundant crappie populations, especially in these smaller bodies of water. 
um, in the Southwest that aren't these major reservoirs. They're more mid-size to lower, smaller size um, impoundments. So you, if, when you get these crappie in there, they tend to take over, um, which will lead to stunting and then bad population, bad genetics, all the things that you don't want in a crappie population. And those sagai, because people aren't out there fishing for crappie enough and taking them out and being the managers. Um, we utilize saw guys, basically a biological manager. You put them in and they're going to go in and help kind of stabilize that crappie population. They'll grow to certain sizes. You'll get a bunch of mixed bag sizes in there. And that helps with eating different size crappie until you start to get to the crappie that we don't want to see eaten um, or kept as often, which are going to be your fish that are over 10 inches. And then from there, your, your managers, your, your anglers, you know, you're hoping that people are keeping a pretty good mixed bag of fish between six and 14 inches. Um, but when they're not, we see overpopulation of crappie, we see stunning. That's where these saw guy come into play. And that's really prevalent down in the Southwestern part of the state. So those are going to be your best public accesses. And what you're looking for when you fish for the bank are going to be um, shallow sheltered water where crappie are going to spawn that are out towards deeper water. So typically coves that are right off the corner of a dam. If you have a long point, a lot of lakes, um, because we don't have natural lakes here in their reservoirs, so they're either creeks or river systems that have been impounded by an earthen dam. When that happens, you, you kind of know what your floodplain is going to be. And so in doing so, the owners of those lakes or the builders of those lakes, in most cases, Grand River uh, Dam Authority, uh, Corps of Engineers, Bureau of Land Rec Reclamation, those are going to be your three major ones. Now, there's a lot of city-owned lakes around the state, and they were the ones who developed it, oftentimes with help from other organizations like the Wildlife Department or like a Corps um, to help with uh, heavy equipment maintenance, stuff like that. So they typically tend to build fishing jetties um, or public access sites in and around the dams. Um, so more often than not, what you'll find is where the dam is at, there'll be a cove that comes off of that dam, sometimes straight off the dam. Arcadia is a good example. Um, the cove below the uh, Central Street Park um, at Arcadia, there's a big long cove that comes in off of the deep water right at the big holding tower of the dam, which is a great holding spot for the saw guy that are in Arcadia. Um, we're just now this year starting to get to the point where we have a good catchable size um, population of saw guy in Arcadia, but Arcadia is definitely a lake to be on the lookout for in the next decade to really start producing a quality saw guy fishery. And that cove that's right there off the dam is a, is a perfect starting point. Great crappie spawning habitat. There's big brush row out in the middle of that cove that holds crappie year round. Um, just really easy um, habitat for a bottom uh, dweller like a saw guy to get from deep to shallow water with its preferred prey source. And that's just what you're looking for when you go to lakes that you're unfamiliar with is start, start in dam or start in coves that have public access fishing jetties um, that are nearest to the dam. If you're not fishing on the dam itself, because fishing dams anywhere is always going to be productive in the springtime because it's just one big transition zone that cuts out into deeper water. And oftentimes you're going to have the river channel um, or other things that were done while building the dam. You get a lot of concrete structure, old bridge pylons, things like that, that tend to be congregated in and around a dam. And those are going to be the types of structure that are going to hold big predator fish as they look to push up into the shallower water, um, either during their spawn or during their peak feeding window, which for saw and walleye is going to be those dawn to, or dusk to dawn hours. Two hours around either side of dusk and dawn are going to be the peak windows for anglers to target um, saw guy and walleye in shallow water in March, April, and May. And then again for saw guy in late October, early November. Are there any sauger in the Red River? Um, I don't have an answer definitively. It would be hard to think they're not. Um, they're an Arkansas River fish. Your red is connecting into the same watershed. So, you know, especially below Denison Dam downstream. Um, 
there is certainly the potential for Sager to be in there. I don't know that um, as a fact, but that would be the type of habitat that you'd look for. But again, out of Denison, you're getting pretty heavy flows that come through that. Um, and the Sauger really kind of prefer the easier lifestyle of the Arkansas River where you don't tend to have real heavy generations outside of peak flood windows. So typically the Arkansas downstream of Keystone all the way to Weber's Falls is a, is a pretty calm stretch of water the majority of the year. Um, but always worth the try, you know. These lakes have been stocked with things over the years. People move fish around, fish move on their own. Um, but fishing downstream of Denison Dam would be a good place to look for. Um, I don't I don't know offhand if Texoma has ever been stocked before with Saugai or with Walleye. Um, but if they have, those fish are eventually going to make it downstream of the dam um, during periods of flooding. And that's the types of areas that you would look to target them would be downstream of those dams and big holding basins with a little bit of current is what you're looking for. Um, and those typically come around like uh, public access around bridges and right of ways, rip wrap walls. Um, those are the type types of places to look as a bank angler. Um, we're uh, we've got still quite a bit of time left. We've got 35 minutes. If anybody else has got any questions, now's a good time to ask them. Um, thinking of anything, uh, you know, major, you know, if there's key takeaways from, from this presentation, it's when it comes to artificial lures, your peak window is from right now. Um, it's going to continue to get better, at least for the saw guy, um, as we get into April, because those saw guy are going to be really reliant on the crappie spawn. Um, so this is understanding each year that middle of March to kind of early to middle may just depending on how far north you are and how you know what type of spring weather we have as far as water temperatures are concerned but peak saw fishing is going to occur during peak crappie spawning um, as far as them gorging they'll be up shallower in the earlier months kind of going through a spawning cycle and you can you can pick some fish off uh, that way when you're starting uh bank fishing a new lake dam good transition area yeah i mean a dam depending on the body of water. I mean, like a Canton dam for sure. Like that's just, um, that's where most of the public access is. Um, it being a prairie lake, you know, bait impounding the North Canadian, real shallow sloping, um, different fluctuating water levels. So it's a really good temperate bass lake for white bass. They're gonna hybrids, they get fluctuating bait sources, but for a fish like walleye, that are going to prefer more of an incoming rising water versus a falling water um, starting on a dam where you already automatically have access to lots of different depths. That's going to be your best starting point. Um, and walleye and sawgai, sawgai especially, have a propensity for hanging around rocky structure. So dams with sawgai, you just you have great habitat already there. Um, where you can really get into the fish though in bulk by kind of getting them in a consolidated area is locating those transition areas like a big point or a fishing jetty with a cove that comes off of the dam prime spawning habitat for crappie and when you can locate that if you can go out and fish for crappie if you like catching crappie or you're like eating crappie you go to a spot like that mid-afternoon you get out there three o'clock um four o'clock kind of catch that peak afternoon evening bite and then as that dies down as the sun starts to go down and those fish that aren't actively on their beds are going to push back out that's when you're going to get the cross of those saw guy coming in um, to look for adult crappie that are in their size range for prey as well as they're going to get heavily um, involved in the crappie fry um, especially you know being a sunfish species crappie tend to spawn in bulk. So you're going to have bedding areas that are very close to each other. You're going to have an overabundance of uh, fry that are going to be born that are going to be protected by these males. And that's an easy opportunity for saw guy to come in, in large numbers, essentially schooling into these crappie. Uh, and that's really what you're looking for. And that typically occurs middle of April in the state, but that's what you're looking for um, anywhere you go. If you don't, if you can't identify that, you know, Google map or whatever the mapping service that you use on your phone or your 
laptop or desktop or tablet browser, typically just go into an aerial view. Um, most public areas are going to be marked on the map. It's going to tell you it's a state park or it's a city park or it's, you know, some type of public access and looking at where the dam is at and then going from there. Uh, most crappie anglers. So, you know, those, the, Dams in the state are typically going to be on the southern or eastern side of the water body, just how the water flows through the state. Our prairie streams are coming from the northwest. They're coming out of Colorado, New Mexico, the Panhandle through Kansas. So all of our water, our big watershed is working. We drain into the Mississippi. So most of our major river systems are pushing from northwest to southeast, which means most of the dams are going to be on the southern or eastern half. Um, and the northern sections of your water body are going to warm up quickest. They're going to get more sunlight. You're going to have south winds, typically more turbid water. So it warms up a little bit quicker. It holds heat better. Um, and those sagai that like the dam areas year round, you're going to see them as the crappie spawn kind of works its way down the main stem of the lake towards those southern coves and areas that's really when you're going to see um, those sagai move with them so definitely look go to the dam but utilize the technology we have now with maps and kind of give yourself a good visual and just if once you start understanding what's happening on the lake at that time of year based on weather and water temperatures, then you can really hone in areas on bodies of water you've never been to as kind of, this is a good starting point. Let's go start here first and try this. And then here's a couple other areas you've identified. And that's a good way to bank fish when you don't have the boat, when you can't just motor up and down and trolling motor, all these different coves, you can come into a state park or a city park where you got five or six coves, lots of shoreline to fish. But when you're on foot, depending on the terrain. I mean, that's a lot of moving around. And if you, you know, the big thing with being a good bank angler, a successful bank angler, especially a multi-species bank angler is consolidating your tackle, figuring out what you love to throw and what works. Um, all, everybody has a preference at some point of what type of artificial lure presentation, rod and reel. When you can start pairing all that together and gaining confidence, you don't need a whole bunch of different rigs and setups for all these different species. You can go out to a lake and throw a baby shad on a medium light action rod with six pound test. You can do that anywhere in the state all through the spring and you're going to catch a multitude of different species. Um, a lot of times you're going to have better days than people who are out there throwing bigger hard baits or bigger soft plastics. Um, so when you can really consolidate, it makes it a lot easier to be a bank angler when you can throw all your stuff into a small pack. Um, you get super effective uh, moving. If you go and you don't really have an idea, you kind of take the kitchen sink with you. It makes it cumbersome. And if you're not immediately on fish, that can be you know a confidence breaker. You, you think you're not in the right spot or you're not using the right lure. Um, so when you can really consolidate, find a few good different bait choices, few good hard baits that you like, few good soft plastics, different size jig heads, and get it down into one or two boxes that slip into a little tote or an easy to carry backpack. And you have one good multi-species rod. It's going to allow you to make so many more casts um, and really hone in where those good areas are. Because um, starting off in a cove is a great idea right off the dam. But there might be one particular 40 yard section of shoreline that is exceptionally better than the rest of the cove. Um, and the way that you ultimately find those areas is by making as many casts as you can. And you just don't have the luxury of being on, sitting on a trolling motor on a boat all day where you can just slowly work. And then not to mention you have electronics where you're marking fish. So bank fishing is, you know, you, you really become a much more skilled angler. The more you fish from the bank, the more bodies of water you attempt to fish from the bank because um, it really hones you in with the things that you need to look for when you are on a boat. Boats just make it too simple. You put your electronics on, you go run a bunch of water, you mark fish, you come back and you fish for them. When in reality, understanding the principles of how these fish lived when they were in rivers, what they relate to now that they're reservoirs, what times a year, what winds to look for, 
all of that is this big wide swath of information that can be overwhelming, but it's, it quickly starts to kind of cart compartmentalize. And the, the quicker that you get to that, um, is really just going to improve your fishing experiences as far as success when you get out there. Um, do you have a nautical map website um, or like that you use? So if you go to our website, wildlifedepartment.com, and you click on our fishing tab, click the where to fish button. Um, when you go to that, it's going to list all of our lakes um, for better or for worse. Not every body of water is listed on there, but it's a work in progress. All the main bodies of water are there. Um, and on the majority of those lakes, especially the major bodies of water. So any of the big reservoirs, medium-sized reservoirs, um, they're going to have a, what, what's labeled as a depth line map. So if you scroll down on that page, down in the bottom left corner, it'll have additional information. It'll have the map of the lake, which is just a PDF created by the Water Resources Board, which will give you some basic information. Not all lakes have all the information on it, but that's going to give you depth, shoreline length, volume, um, and surface acres. The depth line map, is a free service um, that is basically a compilation of uploading electronic data from different um, electronics. So Lowrance, Garmin, Hummingbird, all these different electronics gather data on these lakes. They get uploaded and that's ultimately what, you know, fuels these mapping systems on these electronics, but it's also available online to give you kind of a general idea. They're not 100% accurate. There are going to be some minor discrepancies. It's giving you a baseline kind of what it looks like from the shoreline out to max depth, but it can kind of show you where the river channels at. It'll show you where there's big transition zones. So just go to our where to fish page, click on the lake that you're interested in. And more than likely there's going to be a link down at the bottom left. That's going to say depth line map and just click on that. It'll take you right to the lake and it'll show you. Now, sometimes with those, if you're not familiar with the lake, the easiest way to examine them is if you're on a desktop, especially, or a laptop or a tablet, somewhere where you can separate two screens, pulling up the depth line map in one browser window, and then pulling up a satellite image of the lake in another window so that you can match public access areas because you're not going to see public access areas um, on the depth line map. So identifying the public access and looking at those and then matching it up to the depth line map and seeing which public access areas have the, you know, the best features the most structure areas, which are going to be the, you know, the closer the lines are together, the more rapid the depth change and the shorter um, uh, feet. So closer they are together, more depth change per, you know, foot that you're moving away. So those are what you're looking for. The tighter the lines, those are going to be transition areas. And so when you can put the, match those up with the public access, put you in a gives you a better idea of getting into potentially a better spot faster. Um, yeah, with lake levels. So yeah, that's, but it's also, you know, going out, I love seeing as many lakes as I can during the winter months um, when I'm out traveling, because you get that winter drawdown. We're obviously in, hopefully what are the tail ends of going on a two year drought across the state. Um, but you, even during normal levels, non drought years, you're going to have winter drawdown. So that's basically preparing the lake for spring rains, um, allow for full pool to come in. So you don't have major flooding incidences off of the first rains of the spring where you get too much water coming in. Then you got to open up all these dam gates. You create flooding downstream inevitably. So these big major reservoir systems do what's called winter drawdown. Um, and that gives you a really good picture of the shoreline. So when you can get out in the winter months, January, especially typically towards the end of January, early February is going to be when winter drawdowns at its lowest before you start to see moisture come back into the state later February into March and then April. Um, you get a really good feel for what's on the bottom. Uh, composition is a huge deal. Um, when you draw that water down, even though you might see something like depth change on a map, there's big differences in depth change if the composition of the bottom is not a favorable composition for, you know, these game species, which is going to be, you know, sandy, no structure, kind of just these dead zones that you might get 
bait balls they get pushed back into and temperate bass and largemouth may follow them in there when they're there. But there's nothing really to hold these game fish um, for long periods of time when you want to be able to target them. So you're looking for areas that have, you know, gravel, rock especially most of our game species really relate to that hard bottom when they can find it. Um, and then you add in all of the extra bonus elements of cover and structure, like woody lay down, standing timber. Uh, these are big floodplains when they built these reservoirs, there's old homesteads, road beds, um, big foundational pads, things like that, that are prime for spawning habitat for uh, just ambush uh, at certain times of the year. So taking advantage of winter drawdown at lakes that you plan on fishing in the spring and really looking at all of those factors, looking at the depth line map, going to public access areas that you think are, you're going to have the most success at come good fishing window in the spring. And then just walk in the shoreline and taking a look, you know, you can snap a picture. So you remember, Hey, this tree that's sitting right here, right off of this is this great, you know, drop off with, you know, you're looking for structure that is unique within structure. So if you go up and down a dam, it's pretty much all the same riprap that you can see above the waterline. But during that winter drawdown, a lot of the times, especially in a drought year, you can find things along that riprap that stand out. Maybe a big slab or a huge boulder that was thrown in that creates, you know, some type of water displacement that isn't uniform with the rest. And those areas are always naturally going to congregate more fish. Um, so unique structure within similar structure. If you have a rocky shoreline and it goes on for a hundred yards, where are the pieces within that rocky shoreline that stand out a big wooden lay down, a huge tree that fell in the water that you couldn't see when the water was at full pool, um, a brush pile chain, you know, maybe there's a big drop, like something is caused, you know, back when it was an old Creek drainage, you know, you just have this big, you know, either rock or wood that's got a big cut underneath it that just, you know, separates water column four or five feet in this very closed area. Remembering those places and seeing them will go a long ways towards finding those extra fish when you get into the peak windows of fishing in the spring. Um, lakes in the south to fish for walleye, can you name a couple? So the southwest, I mean, the big one is Altus Luger. That's traditionally been a walleye lake. Now, the majority of the lakes that are in the Southwest um, are going to be Saugai. So when you get into like Warica, Humphreys, Ellsworth, Ellsworth is a really big Saugai fishery as far as total numbers and um, the opportunity to catch a really big fish. Ellsworth is a good one, especially below the dam when they're running water. There's a good stilling basin down in that that works out into a shallow channel. You can put on muck boots when they're pumping some water out of there. And if you can get it at the right time of year, you can really, you know, shoot and fish in a barrel and you can catch some real lunker uh, saw guy out of that um, small tail water behind it. But they got to be running water. Um, and then Duncan, um, Mountain Lake. Um, there's a whole cluster of uh, small impoundments that don't get a ton of fishing pressure. They're kind of the quiet, really good black bass lakes, um, spotted bass and largemouth bass that, you know, they get local pressure from guys who go out trying to catch some, you know, double digit largemouth bass. Um, but all of those lakes in there are very heavily stocked with saw guy. Um, so those are the, those are kind of where you're looking basically from Chickasha down to Lawton. There's a ton of lakes that are in between those areas um, that have all been stocked with Saugai over the year. They're low pressure lakes. They, most of them have pretty good public access um, and they're smaller impoundments. Obviously when you bank fish, you know, pond is the easiest, then creeks, then small rivers, then small lakes, then medium sized lakes, and then big reservoirs, um, big reservoirs, get the most pressure fishing pressure. Um, they have typically the least overall public access because of the, they're so big that these little public accesses are fragmented throughout the lake. And just depending on where they're located, what bottom composition is, what game species are moving into those areas. It's just such, so much more of a, um, of a gamble 
when you go bank fishing if you're not familiar with the areas, especially on the biggest reservoirs, because you're just trying to utilize, you know, the best knowledge that you can take with you, which is looking at depth line maps, looking at aerial footage, identifying public access in good areas, um, and then water temperatures, wind, light cycle, moon phase, all these different things that really have a, you know, a bigger impact on fishing than most people realize on the big water. It's like, if you're going to a brand new place, you're taking a swing in the dark. You're just trying to take as much good information as you can. And hopefully you put yourself on those fish, um, but fish in the smaller lakes and there's tons of them in the state city lakes, city lakes are awesome. Um, you're especially a lot of them have saw guy in them now, but you certainly up your odds on bass, crappie, temperate bass, channel cats, sometimes blue cats, if they're in there or flathead, um, the smaller body of water, build up your confidence, you know, you learn these, these different rigging techniques or these different lures. Those are great places to use them. Um, because ultimately you have to be catching fish to kind of justify what you're doing. Um, and all of these outdoor activities, hunting and fishing are confidence building sports. So, um, putting yourself in the best position to have confidence and that's starting at a pond. You know, you go out to a pond at this time of year, you're going to get into fish, but for the saw guy, certainly those smaller city impoundments in and around the I-44 corridor between Chickasha, Chickasha and uh, Lawton are great places to start. Is there a lake in Black Kettle? Yeah. Uh, Carl Etling. Carl Etling back in the day was a very good pike um, fishery, northern pike. So we put them in there. Uh, there's been several issues with water levels over the years. Um, dam problems where dam repairs have been needed. Um, more recently, we tried to stock tiger musky in there, uh, hoping to create a destination fishery for a trophy fish species. And um, in putting them in there, the hope was to, uh, like we use for sagai in crappie management, uh, we were hoping to do a lot of carp management with the tiger muskie, that they would go in and they would clean up a lot of the carp that had overtaken the lake as water levels had gotten poor, water oxygen had gotten bad. There was a lot of vegetative growth that had overtaken the lake. But back in its heyday, Carl Etling was a pretty good smallmouth bass northern pike lake. Um, it was a destination fishery. We put trout in it for several years. Um, but Carl Etling, it is a department lake. Um, but it's, it's way, I mean, you're in the, the tip of the state. I mean, you're Kenton, Oklahoma. So there's the closest city is Boys city. Um, and you're just, you don't get a big draw of people, you know, as a destination fishery. So that lake overall has just declined as a fishery kind of let nature take its course. There's been work done on the dam. Um, there's been multiple attempts at management and strategy to clean it up, but ultimately the investment in a lake like that, when it has so many inherent problems, you know, being in the panhandle, susceptible to drought, um, susceptible to so many different environmental factors that are out of our control, the odds of Carl Etling, you know, in the near future becoming a you know, a saw guy fishery or a good black bass lake again are pretty slim. Um, but that's kind of where that lake is at, but there are fish in it. Um, you know, we, it gets shocked every year, um, for fish sampling and there's channel catfish and largemouth bass and, um, some pretty tremendous carp. If you like carp fishing, that's a cool place to go camp, go see the dinosaur tracks up there and the bighorn sheep, um, and throw a line in. It's a very, peaceful, tranquil place up on the, the foothills of Black Mesa. So definitely worth a panhandle trip and taking a fishing rod, but it, it's nowhere near what the fishery that it used to be back in the 70s and 80s and 90s before we really started to have water problems up there. Um, we got about 10 minutes left. Does anybody have any other questions while we're on here? Um, kind of through on... On my uh, end, we'd like to thank everybody for being here. Always uh, mention um, we can't do these without you, literally. Uh, we are a non-appropriated state agency. We are 100% funded by the sale of fishing and um, hunting licenses. And with that money, when you buy anything associated with those activities, fishing tackle, marine fuel, 
guns, ammo, hunting equipment, um, basically anything that you'd buy at a sport outdoor sporting goods store. There's a uh, federal excise tax that goes on it. And all of that money goes into a big federal pot with U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And that money is then reallocated to each of the 50 state fish and wildlife agencies based on the population of their state, the size of their state, so land mass, and the uh, percentage of the population and land mass versus licensed hunting and fishing anglers. And we were very fortunate in Oklahoma that one in three, one in four people hunt or fish. Um, which means with fishing license sales and hunting license sales, we're able to get 75% match. And that's what funds all of our projects. Um, so all of our management, all of our fish stockings, all of our boat ramps, fishing docks, piers, all of that comes from 25% um, from the department. We, so we put, if we put in $1, U.S. Fish and Wildlife puts in three. And we have to apply for these grants in our individual positions to acquire that money to do the projects that are ultimately within our job function or what we're passionate about within conservation and management for the state. So without you guys showing an interest, without you being actively engaged, wanting information, um, these just don't take place. So we can't thank you enough. Um, so important for for the state to continue to have a good hunting and fishing heritage as it continues to urbanize, as it grows, as you get more and more companies and people from other states moving here that may or may not share that same passion. Um, there will come a day where those two things will come to a head and the more people that are interested in the sport um, that participate, that look to gain more information, the better positioned we are as an agency and as a state to continue to enjoy um, the outdoors in which we were raised and how we'd like to see that for the future generations. So um, these are incredibly important. So whatever we can do to help you, uh, topics, email me, text me. Um, we want to make these happen. We want, we want you to become the best anglers that you can be, have the most fun, get the most out of it for why you enjoy, you know, fishing or the outdoors. So however we can be helpful, that's what we're here for. Um, do you sell tax online, go to the same pot? Uh, yeah. So any, I mean, if, if you're talking about buying like fishing tackle or something online, yeah, that's all there's a, there's a tax that's taken off of that. So, and that's every, every, all 50 States tap into that, but a lot of States um, are appropriated. So they are having to manage taking state tax dollars and then utilizing that in certain ways, along with their license revenue, along with, um, the federal funds. It gets a lot more complicated. For us, it's pretty simple. As long as people are interested in buying hunting and fishing licenses and participating, we're in good shape. It allows us to spend every state dollar we have of licenses sold and get 75% match. So if we want to do a million dollar project, we only need to come up with $250,000 of that. That is directly from license sales and the other 75%, the 750,000 comes from those excise taxes through a grant system from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife that we as individuals um, within the agency apply for to support our job functions and the projects that we work on, which could be planting food plots, stocking fish, netting surveys, um, buying equipment, any anything that we do kind of falls into that purview. So that's why you guys are so instrumental, more so than pretty much any other state out there. Of uh, We're in really good shape currently in Oklahoma. And we like to see it that way. We'd like to grow it um, responsibly. We'd like to evolve and adapt with the, you know, the changing times and changing environments and all that so that we can still continue to enjoy hunting and fishing in the North American model of conservation, which is user pay, user benefit. It's free for everyone. Um, the most democratic thing out there is hunting and fishing. It's you against the animal, it's you against uh, the elements and the environment. And in order for it to stay that way and not go towards a more European or Asian or African model that it's only for the wealthiest and it's only in certain families. And in order to avoid that, eventually in the United States, we have to continue to have big support from, you know, the users themselves and continuing to, you know, take somebody new. That next generation is more important than the generation that's here now in order for these sports to persist. So we thank you all for being here. 
Um, don't see any more questions. We have our Ask an Angler tomorrow, Bank Fishing Tailwaters. That'll be a good one. Um, we'll focus on the major tailwaters of the state and how you would approach that as a bank angler, um, especially at this time of year when you're seeing lots and lots of activity below dams um, at this time of year. So that'll be a good one. Um, registration's closed for it. If you missed that one, you want to join, just come back to YouTube tomorrow at one o'clock and it'll show a live session plan and hop on that. So till then, appreciate you. Best of luck catching the little toothy critters uh, this spring. And if you ever need any help, you have my contact information, call, text, or email, and we'll get you pointed in the right direction. Stay safe. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon, and we will see you next time.